This week on CrossFeed, no regular stories, but we're going to talk about the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod in convention. the guy who was there. Hi, Pastor Jim Butler from beautiful St. Luke's Lutheran Church in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, the home of the best district in the Synod, the New England District. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm pretty happy with Ohio, I got, I got to say. So, But I didn't go to the convention. All right. But so, I was there, Houston, Texas. By the way, folks, we're not going to be having a show next week. I'm going to be gone to um, a wonderful place called Camp Pineshore, um, which is uh, up around Fitchburg, Mass. Uh, you can find us at, uh, I think it's pineshorebiblecamp.org. And, uh, just do Google Camp Pineshore. Uh, but it's a wonderful Lutheran camp um, that is just an amazing place to be. And so uh, I'll be up there doing the Senior High Week next week. Oh, the, the unless, you... unless Dale can find a fake gym. I don't know. Maybe you can find somebody. Yeah, probably not. But... You know, you got to keep in mind, though, that they do allow Jim there, you know, as a pastor of the week. So I don't know. <laughs> You're desperate. Really desperate. So I don't know. It's my third year. They keep asking me back. So I don't know what to tell you. It's been a while uh, since we've had a, been a an while. episode uh, since the end of June. And, and so uh, thanks, everybody, for, um, you know, sticking around and staying subscribed and all that kind of thing. Um just, there's just been so much going on that it just hasn't worked out for us. Um, and the, the last week we didn't have it because, uh, Jim was at convention. And, yes. um, so, but that's what we're going to talk about today instead of doing our regular stories. Um, uh, for those of you who are not Missouri Synod Lutherans, and I know we've got uh, quite a few, uh, subscribers, uh, readers, uh, listeners, uh, viewers who are not. Um, some of you are probably familiar with what goes on there anyway. Uh, some of you are not. Uh, and so what we're going to do is Jim was there, and, and so he's got um, his, you know his impressions from being there, uh, which are a whole lot better than my impressions because I was – you know, actually working that week. Um, <laughs> but I was sort of watching and listening to the video stream, uh, which I was really thankful that they had that. It was, it was kind of neat. Um, but I had the advantage that I could turn it off when I wanted to actually get something done um, that involved actual thinking. Not a lot of thinking going on. Well, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> but uh, And I, I couldn't turn it off. I was with yeah. the voting delegates. I was sitting right there uh, in the middle of the whole thing. Um which I, I, first impression, folks, I, I really learned there are a lot of stupid people in the world and a lot of them were standing at the microphone there. So um, <laughs> making amendments um, and making comments. But uh, we'll get into that. Um, I, I don't I, I, I don't want to be too negative. I mean, really, it, it was overall a, a pretty positive experience. Um, I'll just give you a little bit about it. Uh, the Missouri Synod meets once every three years in convention. Uh, one of the decisions was we were going to look at going to it every four year. Uh, that passed kind of, sort of, but failed. Uh, it passed with 55%, but being a constitutional amendment, it had to have 66%. So then it wound up failing because they didn't have uh, the, the, the two thirds necessary. But, um, uh, so we were in, it was hot, but I found a great restaurant that had 200 different kinds of beer, a hundred on tap. Uh, so. You tried them all. No, no, but they had golden plates for people who have. Uh, they actually have a, 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 a club you can join to do it. But wonderful place though. The food was really good there too. Uh, so, um, and it was, it was an interesting week. So anyway, we, we meet once every three years in convention and probably the most important thing we do with that is elect our, uh, synodical president and we'll get that. And then otherwise we deal with different resolutions and things that come through. Now, this one was a little bit important because not only did we elect a president, but the other thing is we did some major restructuring of our church body. And so Dale may have some questions about that. I'm going to let him kind of ask the questions and guide me and, and see where, what he's interested in me talking about and then give you my impressions of different things. Okay. So um, I now I was also following 
the Twitter feed of people who were discussing it. And, um, uh, it was, it was kind of interesting t- to follow that. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, it was using the, uh, L- LCMS convention was the, the tag. <laughs> and, um, the, all right. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, um, has sort of, well, it has lots of little political groups within it that like to publish little papers and, and things like that. Yeah, I'd say we do that. Yep. Um, but around convention time, they sort of align into what they consider to be um, conservatives and liberals. But the whole rest of the world would say, what do you mean liberal? <laughs> <laughs> well, some would want to call them liberal, okay? Uh, um, but, uh, they, there's, there's basically um, – there. there's a very – I mean, I'm trying to put this in a, in a, in a good way. Um, I, cause I wouldn't use this terms conservative and liberal. I'm really going to go out here on a limb and say rigid and flexible. Okay. <laughs> because in a lot of ways, uh, I'll say that, that, that there's a ton of agreement. Okay. Nothing in basic Christianity does anybody disagree on. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you know, uh, uh, we all hold that the scripture is the word of God, in, uh, infallible and inspired. Uh, we all would hold that Jesus is the only way to go to heaven, that he died, he rose, all those kind of good things, all the basics and strength of Christian doctrine we hold. We all hold to, to what Luther, to what Lutherans believe. There's no question about that. The issue is though, for I think going around, is how flexible can you be? And some people would see a lot less, fl- lot more flexibility, some would see a lot less flexibility, even to the point of being very rigid. Right. Uh, our disagreements are probably center around um, three areas. Who can who can commune at our altars? Uh, what are the roles of women? And well, how do we uh, look at worship? Or as we simply like to call it, wine, wine, women, and song. And song. <laughs> <laughs> so, those, are, those are really kind of the three major areas of disagreement. Um and they kind of focus in those areas. I, and I, I will confess, I'm on the more flexible side. Okay, so I, I really am. Um, and matter of fact, a lot of conservative people like to call themselves confessional because the, after the Lutheran confessions, and I, I got one person called and said, I'm, "Well, I should, uh, a friend of mine called and said that about somebody else." Said, yeah, well, you know those confessionals. I said, "Excuse me, I am too." Uh, you know, don't. Don't let them use that term. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, um, but now, let's see, before the convention, since you mentioned that, we were getting lots of mail. Um, there's a uh, uh, publication weekly called Christian News. It's uh, published by a uh, non-LCMS pastor. He's trying to get on our roster, never has in 50 years, in New Haven, Missouri. And so he was sending that out weekly. Uh, I can summarize Christian news very simply by saying it is good and original. However, what is good is not original, and what is original is not good. Um, <laughs> uh, um, it's the, it's the Lutheran gossip rag. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's putting it mildly. Um, there was another group. Um, there's a couple groups that were supporting a. a uh, Pastor Matt Harrison, who is our director of uh, World Relief and Human Care. And um, one was called Cross Focus Leadership. And uh, they were sending out email newsletters to all of us. And they were also sending out, um, gosh, I got two books from them. The two books together would cost about um, 35 bucks. Wow. Um, and uh, so uh, I get one, one of them, yay thick. I Did mean, you read it? 20. Uh, no, I'm working my way through it, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's 20 bucks by itself. The other one's this thing called Little Book of Joy, and it's, it's gotta be 10 or $15. And, uh, so, uh, and then the other, uh, group was called, uh, is called Jesus First. Um, now that name, name came from, um, when the first time they met, and they were just kind of talking about what was their vision for the Synod? What would they want people to see? And somebody said, you know what? 
when my kids come to church, I just want them to see Jesus first. I did not know that. And so that's where the name came from. That's that's what. And they were supportive of uh, President Jerry Kishnick and very supportive of a more um, moderate, flexible direction in the Senate. And they sent out about 10 newsletters leading up to the convention, beginning 10 weeks ahead or 12 weeks ahead. And we got one of those a week. Uh, plus, there were other little mailings that we got as well from from various groups out there. So that's just kind of – but things coalesced around supporting either President Jerry Kishnick or uh, Director Matt Harrison for president, right. and they kind of coalesced around those two. And the, the people that supported uh, Matt Harrison were um, – his name ended up on a list called the United List where the various um, sort of conservative or whatever terminology you want to use um, were – they in in uh, I think it was the year that that Jerry Kishnick was elected that there were like three different conservative lists, but all of the like Jesus First and a couple other groups that were more aligned with them, they all supported Jerry Kishnick, and so um, the conservative vote was divided. And so, well, you can't it doesn't make any difference. People try to make that argument, but you can't split the vote because um, you have to have a majority. If there's a plurality, you can split well, a vote. Right, right. But, but if it was, you have a, yeah, it was, you have to have a majority, then you got to go one way or the other. Right. But there, I mean, it was and, pretty drastic. It, yeah, he had the majority, but I mean, it was a pretty drastic majority because of that split. It, it, it didn't ultimately make a difference, but no, it, it didn't make any difference and it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, he was elected in 2001 by, I think it was like 20 votes, roughly, uh, like a 20 vote majority. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and I can go into some details exactly how that happened, but uh, that really was his. Um, uh, uh, it was, by K, but that's it. And he's had a very tumultuous um, nine years as president. Uh, there are those who never trusted him, were never going to give him the benefit of the doubt, and that was the end of that. I mean, and so they just tried to make his life miserable for nine years. Uh, so that was a, a very uh, uh, difficult time for him, but. Um, well, let me begin to talk a little bit about the convention itself. Started off with a, an interesting worship service, uh, with that I would best call fusion. Uh, I mean, they took some traditional music and had traditional hymnody sung to a praise band. Uh, they had a uh, praise band up front. They had a uh, organ. They had a small symphony. They had a children's choir. They had a bell choir. Um, they had all kinds of different arts and artists. Uh, represented um, all these different churches around Houston brought their altars and had the, all these different altars sitting around where uh, for people to take communion. So it was, you know, this real, I, I would, and, and the service was even done in different languages. At one point we had the prayers and the prayers were done in Korean, um, an African language. Uh, I, and uh, I can't remember what the, the Spanish and a fourth language. I can't remember. It was written forth in English. So that we Anglos could read it. But it was really cool to have all these different languages spoken and all these, this, this, this what I, again, what I would call fusion being done. Now, uh, one of the things that was interesting for me watching the Twitter feed. Now, on the Twitter feed, the uh, so called confessionals sort of took over the feed. And, and they were posting a lot. And it, it, I think it sort of scared off everybody else. Um, I was about the only person. And, and I would. When it comes to those sort of two extremes, I'm, I'm pretty much in the middle between them. There's, I, I agree with both sides on on various issues, um, and uh, which by the way, sometimes you know, talk about the um, the the more rigid group calling themselves confessionals. The other side tends to use the word missional, um, which I thought is kind of goofy because if you're if you're confessional by nature, the confessions are all about you know, the mission of the church and that. And, and if you're missional, really, what's your mission to, to bring the teachings that are taught in the Bible as understood in the Lutheran confessions to people. Right. So it's like, if you're one, you've got to be both. <laughs> but, Which is uh, why I like to use the term rigid versus flexible. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, after the, after all the elections were all done, I said, I posted a note and I said, well, isn't it great that everybody who was elected, uh, this year is both confessional and missional. <laughs> But uh, well, talking about the the opening service, um, okay. The, the 
the comments that that I saw about it were uh, complaints about the praise band. All right, um, and complaints. And this really got me. Complaints by pastors that the service went too long. And I thought, every pastor at some point in his ministry, if 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 this doesn't happen to you, pastors, you know, praise God for it, okay? But every pastor that I've never known has gotten at least one comment at some point about service going too long, all right? And and it's and it's frustrating because you go, oh really? You know, you couldn't take out an extra fifteen minutes of your life. You know, the the whatever it was that you had planned was more important. You know, and you, you get frustrated by that kind of thing. But do you hear pastors complaining that the service went too long? I just, oh, it just irked me. I just, you know, it was like, what? What are you doing? I, I mean, was I really? I mean, was I absolutely happy at the whole about the whole thing? No, there are parts of it that you know I'd like. Eh, don't think I would have done it that way. But overall, I enjoyed myself at it. I was sitting next to a guy who obviously was not happy about this in the least bit, especially about the praise band. My view was, what, no church in the 6,000 and LC must have one? Many of them do. And it was a very good one. I mean, uh, and they did some wonderful things. And, yeah, I knew I was, we were leaving. One guy was already on the cell phone compl- calling somebody complaining about it. Uh, but I was just like, you know what? I thought it was well done. I thought it was bringing together a, a wide variety of, of of things. And by the way, I have to say something on, about the, the the worship committee. If you look at the the thing, there was a wide variety of churches represented on the committee that put it together. And they said at first, I mean, they had a hard time coming to a, a common understanding. Uh, they really worked at the theology of worship. They really worked at what was trying trying to you know to bring together here, and. Um, <clears throat> at the end of it, everybody and all their pastors were able to sign off on everything. So, That's you know, impressive. it's kind of neat that, yeah, it was, because there were a variety of perspectives, flexible to, to rigid on there. Um, so that, that, let me talk about, let me talk about the theme just real quickly. Uh, the theme was one people forgiven. Now, President Kishnick had uh, put together a, uh, his vision for the synod, which was, uh, um, one mission, one message, one people. And, uh, which I've always bought into. I always thought that was a really cool, it, 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 you know, a vision is good if it's easy to remember. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a real, and I just thought that that's a, that's a easy one. So, um, this one, it, and really a lot of emphasis on forgiveness and personal reconciliation. Uh, the Bible studies every day, uh, done by ambassadors for reconciliation, uh, Ted Cover was about personal reconciliation and how do we reconcile and how do we receive Christ's forgiveness and how do we take that forgiveness into the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were times uh, uh, during, um, I think the last three days of the convention, there were pastors uh, in um, rooms upstairs if you wanted to go and have private confession absolution. That was a possibility. Uh, for you to take. Uh, there was a prayer tent uh, on the convention floor. So if you had prayers, you could go back there. Or if you need to be prayed for, you could go back there. Um, Ted Cooper, the Bible study leader, was uh, around. And I saw all kinds of people going over to him and talking with him and praying with him and asking him to pray for them. Um, it was really powerful. You know, it was a great thing. Because, you know, what? what is it that we in the church have that nobody else does? The message of forgiveness. Yep. Yeah. This is this is what makes the Christian church the Christian church. The message of the forgiveness, the message of Christ died and risen. I did see one comment, somebody complaining that it was antinomian. <laughs> okay, antinomianism, for those of you who don't know big $5 words like Dale does, uh, means that you can do whatever you want regardless of what God law says. That you can, you know, say, you know, you can watch a pornographic movie and say, ah, but I know God will forgive me. So you abuse the grace of God. How somebody could get that impression out of that theme and out of the Bible studies we had, I have no clue well, unless he's, they were he's not like, listening. He said it doesn't say repenting and forgiven or, or something like that. There was there was no law. It was all gospel. So he said, oh, it's antinomian. I said it's ridiculous because there was a cross on the, on the, the logo and uh, sorry, but the cross is inherently law and gospel at the same time. So, um, 
you know, forgiveness is by its nature inherently law and gospel. Because if I don't repent, I have nothing to be forgiven for. Right, right. So <laughs> I just it irked me. I, I tried to respond to him, but uh, okay, <laughs> weird comments. Like I said, there's weird people out there. Um, the first two days of the convention were given over to this big restructuring, and um, um. Basically, we took every board. We, we had all these different boards in, in, in our church body that ran all sorts of different things. Um, and by a 52-48 vote, we got rid of all of them. And we went to two boards, one for domestic mission, one for international mission. And those are now set up regionally so that it could be possible uh, to have just uh, people from – the Midwest represented on this stuff and nobody from any else else in the country. And that often actually happened. Well, this board is now set up regionally so that you have people from the East Coast, the West Coast, and the other areas. We set up five geographic areas. Um, so you get a lot of uh, pollinate, cross-pollination on these two boards now. The other thing we did was we... Um, uh, uh, the board of directors for the synod, not at this convention, but beginning the next convention, will be elected regionally. And the um, the president of our synod is full time. The uh, vice first vice president is full time. There are uh, there are going to be five other vice presidents, and they are all going to be elected regionally. But they're part time. They kind of do whatever the the synod president wants. They're really there to advise him. And so what they will be doing is then uh, kind of communicating with us what's going on to try to develop better communication. So uh, I feel really good about those decisions. I, that this, this has been the process for about six years. Um, a lot of people, obviously 52, 48, a lot of people didn't like them. Um, but I have felt for over the last two years easily, as I've been reading all the proposals, that this is something we really need to go to. Now we need to st- try to simplify things and give the synodical president more authority. The weird thing is, is they have all the staff in our, what we call the international center uh, in St. Louis, but he actually has no authority over any of that staff. Uh, now they all report directly, to, uh, re- report directly through him, through a person called the chief mission officer. And, um, so uh, he's got a lot more authority over what they're going to be doing, and he has the authority to appoint uh, staff in the synod. So if there's somebody there he doesn't look, is he's not working with, he can say, "Sorry, you're gone. We're going to bring somebody else." And I think that's very important. I think it's very important that the president of synod, whoever it is, has a staff that supports him, that he can be supportive of, and that supports the direction he wants to go. Okay. And so, I really. Um, there's couple things along this line. First of all, I have a question of why with these major restructuring things, were they able to do it by a majority and not a two-thirds vote? Because they were bylaw changes. And according to our bylaws, bylaw changes only may only need a um, simple majority vote. So it wasn't a constitutional no, amendment? No, these were not con- – anything constitutional had to have two-thirds. Okay. Uh, right. And not only do they have to have two-thirds at the convention, they have to have two-thirds of the congregation to vote in favor as well. Now, the two constitutional changes that were made was to change the name of our treasurer from vice president treasurer to chief financial officer. And I can't remember the other one that did pass, but it was pretty – it was kind of innocuous like that. Um, so those should – those things should just, just, just fly through without a problem. Um, there was a motion on the floor to make those changes have to go through – by two thirds, but in order to make that, <laughs> in order to put that through, you'd have to have a two thirds majority uh, <laughs> to make that real change because that's a change in our bylaws, a, 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 a real change. So um, that was part of the problem that we had there. Okay. So then, my next question is: There's um, a lot of the discussion I saw, uh, and in fact, even this is interesting. Um, uh, Religion News Service interviewed Matt Harrison after the election. Uh, in fact, after well, we haven't gotten there yet, but that's, that's, that's go ahead. Okay, um, and but it, it pointed out that he mentioned that a lot of the things that he had um, sort of campaigned against, in a sense, and he didn't use the word campaign, but spoken out against um, those things were implemented, and then uh, he, in one day, lost his job 
when as part of the restructuring and then on the next day got a new job as as president okay and so um so yeah we'll talk about that in a minute but as far as the restructuring goes a lot of people are really concerned about sort of giving the president more power and and the sort of centralized power um where there's concerns about sort of misuse of power indeed you are powerful as the emperor has foreseen the <clears throat> How can I put this? Uh, first of all, um, uh, he did not lose. He would not have lost his position unless he wanted to walk away from it, as far as I know. Because as far as I've been talked to people, President Kishnik had every intention of keeping him in his position. You know, um, I have not read anything that said President Kishnik was planning on, on, on having him leave. I think if, if you know, he, he had done that, he would have been in big trouble. Well, but now, as you must, I've heard relief was absorbed into one of these two new that's, groups, right? But you know, and that's one of the things they're not quite sure exactly what's going to happen. Okay, I mean, there, and, and, and there's no way they could tell exactly how it's going to work out. But staff people, there's still going to be staff doing world right. relief human care work. Right. There's still going to be staff people doing Board of Communications work, you know, the communications of the Senate. There's still going to be people doing this. The way we were set up, and this is really bizarre, is that um, what we, executive staff at the Senate did not report to the president and did not have any, you know, he, he had no authority over them. They reported to their staffs. Uh, they reported to their respective boards. Who do the boards report to? Well, you'd think to the board of directors of Senate. No. They all reported to the Senate convention. And so you actually had a lot of silos. So you actually had two or three different groups really doing their own communication stuff. Uh, you had, you know, the, 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 there were these little separate boards that really, as what they like to say, little silos that weren't communicating with each other. And I talked to some people who took, took part in some stuff, uh, you know, some, some, some work there to try to get these groups to start talking to each other, and they just didn't. And so it was very, very frustrating in that respect. But all the stuff that's been done under all these different boards and, um, is still going to be done. Uh, the staff is going to be, the exact, a lot of the executive staff is going to be retained. But it's just going to be done differently and more cooperatively than it has before. Okay, there's, you know, some people want to talk about the, the Senate president has been given a lot more power. I don't look at it as power. I look at he's been given a lot more authority. And I think proper authority. Because sometimes decisions are made at the International Center. And the president gets blamed for it. Oh, good grief. But he, he, he can't tell somebody to do something. He can't tell them not to do it. But he winds up getting blamed for it. <laughs> You know, he wanted this done. And I've seen this, by the way, on both sides. I've seen when when Dr. Barry was Senate president, he got uh, uh, blamed for something that he really had nothing to do with. And I saw it happen with President Kishnick. Um, so I think it's better now. Now, if something happens, it happens. Yeah, he is responsible for the decision. <laughs> you can rightly because blame guys, him. <laughs> yeah, you can rightly blame him. He is but, you know, he has the authority and the responsibility that goes with it. He has the responsibility and the authority that goes with it. A lot of times in churches, what we wind up doing is we give responsibility but no authority. And I frankly think responsibility and authority has to go together. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my last church, I, there is a church that um, wanted to use our fellowship hall to worship in. And um, they... Um, didn't pay their rent and everybody was just really upset when we wound up having to end the thing and somebody looked at me and they said why didn't you stop this from happening i'm like they called they asked me if they could worship here i gave the information to the trustees well why didn't you tell them no because i can't tell them yes <laughs> <laughs> i have no authority to t make a decision this isn't my issue this is the trustees issue you know board of properties issue mm -hmm. you know but if you want me to tell them no, then you got to give me the authority to tell them yes. And if you want me to tell them no without asking anybody around here, you got to give me the authority to tell them yes without. Now, that's not a power issue. It's an authority issue. Okay. And I say the same thing. And by the way, when I looked at this and somebody uh, – uh, um, I always assumed 
that the person that, that there may be somebody in the president's office that I wasn't, I couldn't be f- fully supportive of. Okay. I always tried to say, what if somebody was in the president's office given this authority and I'm not real happy with the guy all the time? Do I still believe that the president of Senate, regardless of who's sitting in that office, should have this authority? And I always came to the conclusion, absolutely yes. Oh, very nice, Blaine. Okay. Because it's just the right thing to do. All right. Well, that makes sense. All right. Mm-hmm. So, um, so th- now there was some other restructuring stuff that was talked about beforehand um, of uh, districts being restructured and, and things like that. So what happened with that? Okay. Um, we have 35 districts. Basically, we came to a thing saying, okay, question is, what do you want out of a district? Okay. Now, the districts in the Missouri Synod vary in size. There's almost 300 and some churches in the Michigan district, and they have all kinds of executive staff. They almost replicate the Synod office building locally. Okay. Then you come to New England. Uh, and the greatest district in the Senate, well, we have a full-time district president, we have a part-time uh, missions guy, and we have uh, – who, who, who works – help us planning new churches and doing transforming of churches, and then um, a business manager and office administrator. That's our staff, okay? Anyway, so what do, what do districts um, – how they configured um, – what do we want a district to do? What should it do? What kind of staff does it need? Um, how big should they be? So, uh, uh, um, and so, uh, you know, uh, um, and so all those kinds of questions kind of play into this thing. So there's going to be kind of a three year study done now of what the districts are like. Uh, if there's any kind of merger, actually, New England will be a pilot project. Uh, some of the Northeast districts have volunteered to be a pilot project on this. Um, and, uh, if not changing the district, can, can we, you know, jointly hire staff together? Yeah. You know, to, to kind of serve the whole, the region, you know, what, what can we do? So that's kind of where that is. It, it really, we said, let's do a study of, of what districts are all about and, and how should they be configured and what would be the best way to have them configured. Okay. Which also just given the fact that we have non-geographic districts too, um, Yes. That. We have two nine geographic districts. Um, one is called the English District, and uh, it was founded. Originally, there was a church body called the English uh, Evangelical Synod. Um, they wanted to join the Missouri, but they were English-speaking, and we were a German church, so we said no. And then in the early 1900s, they joined, and this is where all the English-speaking churches were supposed to join, because God knows that you know the hundreds of years that the Missouri Synod was going to form, they would never stop speaking German. Um <laughs> So uh, that group is still out there today. Um, and then the other one is the um, um, SCLC district, the Slavic Evangelical Lutheran Church, which once again was another Luth- it was another Lutheran church, only they were Slavs. And um, they merged in and they said, well, we want to retain our identity, you know, as a Slavic group. And we said, OK, but, in, you know, in so many years, you're supposed to merge in the local geographic districts. Well, that kept getting pushed off and now probably never will. Um, there's a group up here that would feel for them. Uh, there's a group up here in Massachusetts and other places called the National Evangelical Lutheran Church. And they were a Finnish body that merged in the Missouri Synod. Uh, and a lot of them have almost lost that identity. And so they're like, man, we wish, uh, you know, we've been able to, you know, keep that identity as, as these Finnish churches. Hmm. So they, they can kind of relate to, to what, uh, that desire that these groups have. Okay, well, let's move on to the election then. Okay. The election was an absolute shock to everybody. Thanks. Okay. So. Oh, it, no question. If you had been on that convention floor, there was a feeling of shock. The first day there was a a motion on the floor to change the schedule to make the election of president the first thing. That was defeated 5248. All these restructuring proposals kept passing 5248. We saw that number, 5248, again and again and again. Everyone, and I do mean everyone, thought the President Kishnick would be reelected 5248. To the point that <clears throat> I was talking with some people and some of the United List people 
actually visited some of the Jesus first people and said, can you support uh, President Herb Mueller as first vice president? Because we already know we've lost the, the presidential election. Hmm. Um, and I was told that by a person on both sides. Wow. Um, yeah. That that was the, um, yeah. Um, somebody talked to Matt Harrison uh, after the election. They said, where were you? He said, I was back in the very back of the hall, ready to hang my head in shame. He thought he had lost. I'm telling you, when that, when we looked up and we saw that he had won by 55, 45, to, you could have heard a pin drop in the place. It was absolute silence. Then one idiot up front goes, yeah! And we, you know, which I just thought was really an insulting thing. Um, but um, it was very moving. Um, he took the stage, which was in the minutes that he would have it. He spoke very graciously. Um, he said, um, you, I give them a Senate credit. You've continued to elect sinners. Um, I have no desire to coerce anybody. Um, he set out a plan. It's a, uh, uh, you can find it. Uh, I think it's like it, it's time.com or it's time.org. Uh, and you can see the plan that he set out to, to where we do have disagreements to set up these, 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 uh, kind of one-on-one groups and try to, or the small groups to try to come to a consensus on, on, on different issues. Um, and, um, so, and I'll tell you what he, he, what he said was really at the very beginning, really, really hit me. He said, um, when one part of the body hurts, all parts hurt. When one part rejoices, all parts rejoice. I know there are a lot of hurting people in this convention hall right now. And I know there are a lot of people rejoicing right now, but we've got to have compassion for each other right now. Yeah. So I was uh, very impressed by those words. I he made it. Uh, I think a very healing word right then. Yeah, I I watched that because I was I was really curious about the the election, um, and uh, so and so I I watched his acceptance speech in that, and and then I was really saddened by the the comments on Twitter over the next several hours and a couple of days uh, to the point that Paul McCain from CPH, um, he and I think one or two other people sort of said, um, hey, did you guys pay attention at all to um, to Pastor Harrison's comment, you know, his acceptance speech? And it was sort of like, go back and listen to that because you guys, you may have supported him, but you're not listening to him. Right. So that's... Um, after he spoke, um, Pastor Charlie Mueller from Trinity Roselle, Illinois, who is probably who's very influential in Jesus First. I don't know if he's the president. Uh, I don't know his exact role in the place. But he took the microphone and uh, President Kishni called on him. And he said, um, as someone who supported another candidate very vigorously. I believe that we all need to stand and together show our support for our new president-elect. And I'd like the minutes to read so. Now, what he wanted to say was, I move that the minutes show that the vote was unanimous, which is often done in a um, uh, church call meeting. When you call a pastor, you know, there's often a motion made to to make it unanimous. He was told by the parliamentarian that he could not do that. They would be ruled out of order. But he could do this. So um, that was an extremely gracious move on his part. And it set some people back on their 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 heels. Um, I actually had one person from the United List group tell me if the election had gone the other way, we would not have been so gracious. You know, what, that was a very classy move on his part. Um, it spoke volumes. Um, and um, I can say I actually spent some time with that group. Um, 
that day, and they all told me without a without a doubt, we're going to be we'll do our best to be supportive, and um, we're going to tell them that. And they did personally. They they got some time with him, and uh, told him, you know, we're we're we we want to be your best friends. We want to be supportive of you. Uh, we do not want to have happen to you what happened to Jerry Kishnick. They have a group that says we're not going to be there for you. We're not going to support you. We're going to do everything to defeat you from day one. You know that they don't want that to be that type of people. Well, that's um, tremendous. I I really hope that this can. There's always going to be little skirmishes and disagreements and things like that. Mm-hmm. But I see what I really think that we need in the Missouri Senate more than anything is people talking to each other and more importantly mm-hmm. people listening to each other. I agree. Um, you know, the Jesus vs. folks told me that, you know, we're going we're gonna to be a loyal opposition, but we're going to be loyal. You know, and where we think, where we, you know, think he's wrong, we will say what, what and how we think he's wrong. But we will be loyal. You know, we're, we're not going to, um, you know, try and turn on him or anything. Um, that was followed by the first, the election of the first vice president. Um, and uh, that was um, Southern Illinois District President Herb Mueller, um, who I have gotten. I, I, I read an article by him, a couple articles by him. Um, I think he's just a fantastic person. Oh, somebody asked me what I thought about Matt Harrison being elected. I voted for Jerry Kieschnick, okay? But I have no problems with Matt Harrison being elected. I thought, you know, if... Um, if some of these restructuring things did not pass, uh, had not passed, if it had been 52, 48 the other way, I would have voted for Matt Harrison. Uh, my view was, um, that it would make no sense to elect the man who basically said, I don't want this to happen and then have to turn around and implement it. Um, and who I think had a very good vision for where he wants the Synod to go. Uh, I liked a lot of what I read in its time, but uh, who I don't think is going to be able to do it for the next three years because he's going to be busy working with transition and shuffling things around in Synod headquarters. So um, I my, my belief was if this was Jerry Kuchnick's baby, let's reelect him. Let's let him have to deal with the transition and deal with everything over the next three years. Yeah. That was my view. That's why I voted for him. But my view was we had an embarrassment of riches. Okay, I, you know, I, I, I thought either one, or I think they were both men of integrity. I think they were both gospel-oriented men. I think they were both people who have a heart for the church overall. And so they both had my total, complete support. So uh, I have no problem saying I will support him, you know, as strongly as I can, remembering him in prayer and everything else. Yeah. So um, that leads to another question, and that is... sure. What? How does the election of the synodical president affect the local church? I don't think it does. <laughs> and, and that's something that I've been struggling with as 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 we were sort of moving up toward the um, the convention. You know, when we got a uh, slip for you know making your nomination mm-hmm. and and all that kind of stuff. And and um, you know, and, and people are really you know like. Their lives are like revolving around this election, and and I'm thinking, okay, as a pastor of a local church, how does how is this going to affect me? I'm thinking, I can't think of any way. All right, this is going to affect you know where our mission dollars go, or you know, and stuff like that. Some guys it will. Some guy, some there are church and pastors out there who said, as long as Jerry Kishnick was in office, he, they would not give a dime to synod. Now they will. They'll change that. That's okay. That's just wrong. Me? I, yeah, I, I'm with you. But that's that's the attitude I've heard. Okay. You know, our 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 mission giving will be just as much. Um, you know, yeah. I don't. Now, I I think if you had a radical change, I mean, if you had somebody you know who wanted, I think, take the synod in a radically more liberal direction. Um. That might affect. Well, well I, now I don't know. Some things might get affected. For example, uh, President Kishnick has been very supportive of what was called what is called the Transforming Churches Network. Um, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how supportive um, Matt Harrison would be of that effort if he's going to, you know, try to shut that down across districts. I don't know. Um, President Kishnick was very supportive of alternative forms of worship, and uh, his worship commission reflected that. Um, 
I don't know if Matt Harris will be supportive of it. The sad thing is, is that, you know, um, in my mind is if you don't have somebody there in the Senate office who's supportive, then you get a bunch of Lone Rangers doing whatever they want to do rather than, you know, they're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But rather than have some people at the Senate trying to give some guidance as to how you do this right. Yeah. So that's 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 you know that's that's how it might affect it just you get to, you know some some things like that who gets you know chosen for various offices that he gets to appoint um although he, he's made three appointments so far that's his executive staff um the president of the senate has three assistants a senior assistant a secondary assistant and a church relations assistant the three people he picked uh, are were all from the uh World Relief Human Care staff, which makes sense to me. It's people he works with and feel comfortable working with. But people who know them, and I don't know them from Adam, are all, you know, said these 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 are, these are you know, church people of the highest caliber. You know, um, one of them is a, a, a woman, uh, which is interesting because we've never had a female um, executive assistant to the president before. But they, you know, everybody says, they, they all, you know, who knows these people? So these are people of the highest caliber. So, you know, these, these are excellent suggestions. And that would be from people I know flatly didn't vote for him. But, you know, these are, you know, this is the direction he's going. This is a good, good thing for us to see. Um, but no, I don't think overall, um, I can't say, um, um, I can't say when President Barry was elected, it affected my local congregation at all. I don't think the President Kishnick's election has affected it very much at all. Um, and I don't think President Harrison's going to affect me very much at all either. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I just, I don't understand why. I mean, I, I've heard, yeah. of, I, I saw a post from somebody saying that if the, what was it, um, the floor committee eight, was that the restructuring one? Okay, they said if if those things passed and President Kishnick were reelected, they were going to leave Senate. That there were churches that were going to leave Senate if that happened. And I thought, what a ridiculous thing to leave Senate for. It's not doctrinal. It's not you know. There's nothing scriptural. You know, reasons. You know, if if it was a well, doctrinal uh, thing, fine. But yeah, that was interesting because people were like, "We're so divided. We're so divided." I kept hearing that on the convention floor. And I, I didn't get to the floor. Two or three times I, I wait, was waiting, but then they called a question. And, and so, you know, you didn't get to speak. But I would have said, look, structuring stuff, yeah, we were divided. Okay, there's questions whether or not this is a good thing to do. That's legitimate. But when it comes to stuff of Scripture, we're not divided. Look at how those stuff passed, 80, 90, 85, 90%. Mm -hmm. There's a huge unity on the stuff that really matters. Right. Yeah. All that other stuff is just, you know, personal preference kind of stuff and different right, people you know. looking at it from different angles and stuff like that. But that stuff right. doesn't really matter, you know, compared to the, you know, doctrine and scripture and things like that. But that you talk about those big votes and that leads to something else that that really kind of irritated me. And that was that. All right. There was a vote on the malaria thing. And now the malaria thing, I heard one. I was kind of following that, listening to it in the background. And um, mm. and I heard one person talk about that. Um, well, if you support this malaria initiative, you're also encouraging the use of DDT. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I, I can see the you know the concern there. Um, because in the malaria thing, Pat, all, all of these passed like um, ninety five percent or better. Right? There is that one, and there is a a, a commending of. Um, our work in Haiti, uh, response to the Haitian earthquake. And the president, the two presidents of the two Lutheran churches in Haiti, one of which is a partner church of ours and one of which is not, were both present for that. Um, these should have been slam dunks 100%. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They were, I think on one of them, looked like, you know, five people voted against it. The other one, like two, one or two people voted against it. Okay, you have to understand the way this works. Um, you have this little uh, handheld device, and your smart card goes in it, and you hit one for yes, two for no, and it's completely anonymous. Nobody knows who votes yes, who votes no. 
It's, it's not like the the the, the um, house, Senate in the house in the house where it has the names up there. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows. So some people vote no just because they can. But see, that really irritates me. All right, I mean, there was there was one of on human trafficking. You, human trafficking against uh, sex slavery. Yes. How can you be in favor of that? All right. So you know, because they can. Yeah, but this are, has been in effect since 1989. That's when the system first started being used. I was actually thinking, actually, that's a witch talk convention. I was there when they first started using it. Since that time, there has been one vote, which was 100 percent, and that was to go into fellowship with the Lutheran Church of Haiti. Other than that. There's always been somebody out there voting no. And believe me, if, you, if you'd you listen to it, they were, please, please, let's make this one 100%. You know, we, we should all be behind this. Well, I'm going to tell you what. You can stand up there and you say, please make it 100%. There's somebody out there going, I ain't going to do that. It's just a sinful, self-willed attitude. Right. That's, all it, that's all it is. And here's the problem with it. All right. The press sees that. Right, and they go, oh, there's people, you know, who have been chosen as delegates, representing congregations, that are in favor of human trafficking. Yeah, I think they figure out that. No, I don't think they're that dumb. I think they, I think they know just as well as anybody else. If it had been a voice vote, or the names that, or, or you know, if it had been a voice vote, they never would have voted against it. But the fact that they could do it, and they could do it anonymously, it, let them do it. it if anybody who doesn't know that, you know, they, these these guys who recorded, they they've reported on it every three years, so they know that they know that kind of attitude is out there. I know, and and you know, there haven't I haven't seen any articles of of anybody sort of jumping on that. But I just thought, what kind of a message does it send, though? Anybody that saw those numbers, you know, it just. It it just sends a horrible message. It, it does. It, it just sends a you know. It to me, it just says some people, some people. Like I said, there are a lot of stupid people in our synod, and some of them are sitting in that convention hall, and some of them are standing at the microphones, uh, you know. And uh, uh, so that it was. I, I gotta say, in, in that respect, yeah, that the kind of stuff does tick you off. But I mean, the stuff that's really important, man. We we are we are behind that. We are together on that. It's interesting. I was talking about I was talking to one of the pastors who's more more on the flexible side of things, and he was telling me about a church that he that's close to him that's more on the more rigid side of things, and they're working together uh, with some of the other churches to expand gospel outreach to the Muslims in their area. Good on you, mate. Great. Yeah. So that was really a cool thing, you know. And they're like, you know, what's really important? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's reaching right. people with the gospel. Here's here's my challenge to to everybody out there that's listening. Whether you're yeah. uh, if uh, if you're not a pastor, go talk to your pastor. If you are a pastor, ask yourself this question. All right, what are we doing with the other churches in our area um, to work together to to reach out to whoever? All right, mm-hmm. and um, so I know when I got here, uh, there was already some stuff going on with churches working together and I just sort of jumped in and, and got involved in it. But um, there's just so much of uh, an attitude among churches. And this isn't just a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod. This is all over the place of, of churches that sort of go, well, if, if I support other churches, I'm going to encourage my members to leave our church and go to that other church or, you know, or something ridiculous like that. All right. And, and it's ridiculous. We need to work together because we can accomplish more together than we can separately. Um, so, right. so I encourage which is, you by the way, the that. idea of the, the idea of a, uh, any church domination is that we can do more together than we can separately. Right. Um, another big thing that we did, and speaking of this the whole area, was um, up to this point, there's been a very long protocol that's been need to be done in order to um, come into alter and pulpit fellowship, what we call where we can exchange pastors and commune together with other churches. Uh, one of the things that's happening, especially since the ELCA made their decision last year, by the way, by 80%, we <laughs> very respectfully but firmly told the ELCA, well, you made the wrong choice. Um, and um, we, we're not going to walk away from our relationships, 
yet. Um, that, that's going to be under the, the for the president and, and the vice presidents to, to to keep and to monitor on over the next three years. But we did say, you know, we're, we're not happy, and that came through very clearly. A matter of fact, the ELCA usually sends a representative to speak to the convention. wasn't there this year. You're right. They usually do. I yeah. don't think about that. So, no, it wasn't there. So, um, to go back to our, uh, uh, uh so, so, uh, oops. so anyhow, there's, so there's some very, there's some small splinter bodies in the world and they're looking for a confessional Lutheran church to give them leadership and stuff. And they're looking to us. And there's also, by the way, some huge ones too. Uh, like the uh, Lutheran church in Ethiopia with over five point, over five million members. And they're beginning to talk to us. Uh, because they're not happy at what they see the rest of the Lutheranism doing. And so what we've given the president of Synod flexibility is if he sees some small group out there and they're really winning a lot of support and they're, they're like, you know, why can't we commune? And he and, um, uh, our, our church relations commission come to the conclusion that, yeah, this group is, is, is solid, that they can go ahead and, and, and enter into fellowship with them on behalf of the Synod. Without a convention vote. I mean, right now it's like a six year process. But when you have a church body where you have all the pastors from the other church body sitting across the table from you, <laughs> you know, you don't, you know, they can't, they can't figure out why that you need to go through six years. There's only, you know, you know, there's only, you know, just this many churches, you know, why can't we do something real quickly? So, um, that was rather controversial. Um, but, um, it did pass by a substantial majority. Now, yeah, uh, I was kind of surprised by that. You know, especially talking about the whole kind of giving more centralized power and stuff like that. I thought, this is actually kind of an example of centralized this power. This is huge. Um, but I think I think what made a difference was some um, a district president, um, Dan Gilbert from Northern mm-hmm. Illinois, who spoke about a Norwe a, a group of churches in Norway. Now they have a state church in Norway. Um, and these guys are technically breaking the law. You know, by going a different direction. They could, they could really face some repercussions for where they, what they're saying. Um, and he's like, you know, what are we going to do? Tell this guy he's got to wait six years? You know, we want to be able to support him now. And, um, you know, and he's going to be here in next, next week talking to us about our desk. You know, President Elect Harrison, if he can meet with him. Um, now, here's a real situation. And I think people are like, wow, okay, now we understand. I think what they really wanted when they heard this, because it was supposed to be small, emerging something, Lutheran Church, or they can't remember the terminolo- terminology exactly that they used. And people were like, oh, what, what are you talking about? And I kept saying, somebody needs to make this concrete. So he was talking about that one, and I can't remember what the other church body, the other church that, that they talked about. Again, it was a real, it was a small splinter group that's just making this tremendous pr- pressure. What are you people doing? Um, and they're really looking to us for, for some help and strength. Um, okay, you know what? This, that's huge. And people are like, we've got to help these people. You know, we've got to support them. If this is what it takes, then okay, we're, we're going to give the president some authority so you know they can sit back and say, okay, we we know the Missouri Senate's got our back. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so yeah. I, one more issue, um, sure, and that is something that's very close to you, um, and that is alternate paths to ordination. We didn't touch on that. There was, I heard discussion on it. What happened? Did that get tabled? Uh, it got tabled. They, there was a, there was a, um, there was a, uh, uh, actually, if you, if you'd been watching that, uh, you, you would have seen me if they kept the discussion going because I was standing at a microphone, uh, cause I was going to speak very much in favor of the uh, proposal. And, um, <clears throat> what, uh, um, and I, I don't want to go into big history. Uh, 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 what happened was it, there was a motion to send this back to committee because they didn't like the way some of the stuff read. They thought it was kind of unclear. Um, so um, the committee re-edited it but never brought it back to the convention floor. Okay. Um, 
And what they decided to do is, um, and I was talking with somebody, uh, cause I was really, I was kind of like, when, when is this? And they said, oh, they're not going to bring it back. They think they can deal with this outside the convention. Okay. Um, and, um, uh, which, you know, which I said, oh, okay, you know, and I was like, you know, chock darn. They said they're probably going to do what they wanted to do anyway. Uh, which is basically this. Uh, we have some people out there who are number one, continue supporting Beacon programs in our, um, just in our synod, uh, you have a, I think, a lay deacon in your congregation. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I remember a second. Yeah. So continue respecting those guys. If they are in active word and sacrament ministry, and this is some churches and like guys who could go up to Alaska and other places where there's nobody around. Um, and uh, they begin, you know, that this, this word and sacrament ministry, if they're doing that, that they would, uh, we would develop a, a process where they would become assisting pastors and they would be, uh, ordained and, but under the supervision of an active, pa- uh, of a pastor who is, uh, has a, uh, an MDF. And they would always be under that pastor's supervision for their work. And they're only authorized for ministry in that one location. They can't take a call somewhere else. So I think it's a really good move. I was very supportive of it. It uh, It's very important for us, I think, to regularize these guys in, in, their, in their work. And uh, But it kind of, you know, right now, officially, we keep doing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um that's pretty much it for me, and I think we're running a little long. But um, any other uh, sort of impressions? Anything else that you want to mention? You know, I came I came home feeling very good. Uh, it was very grueling. Um, it really was. Nothing's made that somebody doesn't want to offer an amendment. No amendment so stupid that somebody won't second it. <laughs> they have to discuss it. Uh, it. I think it would have been helpful if we had. Originally, there was a proposal to do the structure stuff a year ago. Looking back, I think that would have been good because I think spending the first two days dealing with the structure stuff just wore everybody out. I want to tell you, but by the, you know, by the time we went Sunday through Saturday morning, we were all exhausted. We were, all, it was cruel. It, it, it really was tough. But I think we came, I think we made a lot of good decisions. I'm really happy with everything that happened. Um, and I just pray for our church body and uh, that God will continue to lead us and, and move us to the future. Okay. So um, so we had one piece of feedback. It's been ages, but um, I, I did get a piece of feedback on Facebook um, from somebody. That, that This is actually from one of the members of my congregation. Um, and, uh, she said, hi, pastor. I just want to make a remark about your crossfeed today. I only listened to the first 15 minutes regarding the teacher. This is a very hard topic. All right. This is a teacher who at a Christian school who had been, um, uh, removed because she got pregnant before she was married. All right. Um, and she says, uh, it's a hard topic. Not sure what's right or wrong here. But my first thought was Mary wasn't married at first. I get it, but all right. What about teachers who have sex before marriage or just think about sex before marriage? Like you said, where do we draw the line? So who are we to judge? I don't know. Just wanted to comment. The teacher was wrong, but what about forgiveness? What message are they sending? All right. And this is something that, that, you know, we talked about this, um, that on the one hand you don't want to condone sin on the other hand you you want to uh confess forgiveness I, I think what it really comes down to in these situations and each school sort of has to handle this um on their own but on the one hand uh you need to have your for one you then the problem that school had was they didn't have very clear guidelines of of what the requirements um sort of moral requirements were it was very vague um but you need to have that clear. And then if a person goes outside of, of that, then if, if it's written up so that that person is going to be removed, then so be it. But you still need to make sure that you communicate that um, you're still forgiven. All right. But we have certain requirements, you know, the same way that a pastor who has an affair is going to be removed. That doesn't mean that he's outside of God's forgiveness. And, and it's important that we draw that distinction. All right. Um, 
So great comment. Thank you for that. Uh, it's from Jan. And um, so also a shout out to Dave over in Virginia um, who sent me a note saying that he was having a hard time getting the um, the feed, the video feed. And uh, it turns out what happened was uh, the feed was getting too big. And, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, it was the audio. Anyway, um, the feed was getting too big, and it was getting kind of chopped off. And, and so if some of you had trouble uh, downloading some episodes, and then all of a sudden you could, uh, from now on, only the most recent 100 episodes uh, in each feed will be available. Um, but the other ones are, I mean, they're still online all over the place, so it's it's not like you can't find them anymore. Um, but just as far as in the feed itself, uh, we're cutting off the older episodes that way just so that we don't run into errors. So, uh, so thanks, Dave, for pointing that out so that I can fix that. So, um, and so, uh, all right, we, we probably have people that, uh, you know, that are, are watching this or listening to this because of just the topic that we're talking about. So uh, welcome, first of all, to any, uh, new viewers and listeners. And, um, and I also want to say that we love to hear from you because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, controversy, even though we are pretty united on the important stuff. Um, there's still a lot of controversy going on. We'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts, uh, especially people that were at the convention or like me were following the Twitter feed, but anybody else, um, or even if you just pop over to the LCMS website, a lot of the stuff is still up there. Um, and you can, a lot of the video, uh, especially the Bible studies and stuff, uh, really great. And, and that stuff is, as far as I know, is still up there. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so you can go check that stuff out, you know, after the fact, even to, to find out exactly what was said and, and that. Um, I actually used the, uh, Ken Klaus did a, a great Bible study on family. And, um, I used that as a springboard for a blog post, uh, this past week. And, uh, so we'd love to hear from you. Can, you can send us a note. You can either, we're on Facebook. You can, uh, post a comment on Facebook. Uh, just look for Crossfeed News and, and you'll find it. Um, or you can send us an email to podcast at crossfeednews.com and, and we'll get that. Um, or if you're watching this on uh, one of the video sharing sites like YouTube, you can post a comment there and we'll get that as well. And we will respond to those comments on our next episode. So thanks. Which will be in two weeks. Yep. Thank you yeah. guys for all listening to me pontificate. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> Take care. God bless you all. All right. Good night, everybody. God bless you.